Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining um, us for a, a third session of this symposium on Napoleon and his legacy, warfare, politics, and society. My name is Alexander Mikabiridze. I'm a professor of history at uh, Louisiana State University in Shreveport, uh, and uh, Ruth Herring Noel endowed chair for the curatorship of the James Smith Noel Collection, which is uh, hosting this conference virtually. I also wear the head of the president of the Masina Society, which is the organizer of this uh, one uh, of this symposium. And um, I hope you've been enjoying the uh, sessions over the uh, uh, last uh, two, you know, three days. We started on Thursday with a wonderful lecture by uh, Professor Broers, uh, and then had uh, uh, discussion uh, panels yesterday uh, uh, with uh, Professor Black's uh, uh, keynote speech. Uh, and we continue today with, with the uh, full day of conferences, uh, uh, panels, including this one uh, on new perspectives on individuals in history. And I'm very delighted to introduce our speakers today. Uh, we will go as they're listed on, on the program. Uh, so uh, our first uh, presenter is uh, uh, Jacqueline uh, Reiter. Uh, she is, uh, let me spotlight her. <laughs> Let me see where she is. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I can't find her. Jacqueline, you're here, right? Aha, uh -huh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, Jacqueline received her, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Reiter uh, uh, received her PhD from the University of Cambridge in 2006, and she uh, conducted her research on the uh, role of national defense in the British political debate during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Her first book, uh, which I'm proud owner of, is The Late Lord, The Life of John Pitt, the second Earl of Chatham. The, the other Pitt, right, usually overshadowed by, by <laughs> the more famous one, uh, which uh, discussed the uh, political and military career of, of uh, uh, Pete the Younger's uh, lesser known, albeit uh, older brother. Her articles appeared in History Today, Journal of Society uh, for Army Historical Research, uh, she has written also for the history of parliament. She has co-written a, a chapter with John Bew uh, on, on the British war aims for the forthcoming Cambridge History of Napoleonic Wars, which I'm co-editing. And uh, she is currently writing on a book on one of the uh, those wonderful characters that Napoleonic era is, is full of, uh, one of the delinquents, as, uh, <laughs> as uh, <laughs> the Professor Broers mentioned, and as uh, Jacqueline will explain to us. Her presentation today is entitled a scoundrel for all seasons, um, Sir uh, uh, Holmes, Riggs, Popham's amphibious career. Without further ado, Dr. Reiter. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Um, ooh, how do I do this for the PowerPoint? That's a good start, isn't it? Um, you should be able to um, open the PowerPoint and then at the bottom of your Zoom. Yes, share there is option. a share screen. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. that one Make there. sure you're sharing PowerPoint and nothing, nothing, uh, yeah. <laughs> no other file. <laughs> okay. Can I, uh, right Wonderful. now, here we, hello, can you, yeah, there we go. Can everyone see that? Excellent. Yes. Yes. Good. Excellent. Right. Here we go. The court martial of naval captain Sir Hoon Popham broke up shortly after three o'clock on the 11th of March 1807. Less than a year previously, Popham had absconded from his post defending the Cape of Good Hope with six ships, 1,800 British soldiers, and the reluctant blessing of the Cape's military governor. Popham was well known for cropping up in unexpected places. On this occasion, he excelled himself, travelling more than 4,000 miles from where he should have been to attack Spain's South American colony at Buenos Aires. After initial success, nearly the entire British military force became prisoners of war. Popham was recalled to Britain and placed under arrest to answer two charges, removing his naval squadron from the Cape 
and attacking the Rio de la Plata without orders. It seemed an open and shut case, and yet when news leaked out of the HMS Gladiator in Portsmouth Harbour, where the trial was being held, the verdict was apparently an honourable acquittal. The news swiftly swept to London by telegraph, and most of the morning papers re reported it the next day. Popham had long been stoking the popularity of his cause through a carefully orchestrated campaign talking up the benefits of his South American invasion for British trade. £300,000 worth of silver had been deposited in the Bank of England as a result of his exploits. His efforts at publicity clearly paid off. When Popham left the gladiator, cheering crowds followed him as he walked through Portsmouth. Even the church bells rang in his honour. I'm opening my paper with this story for three reasons. The first is obvious, it's a rollicking story. Popham's unauthorised trip to Buenos Aires is probably the most notorious episode of his life. It certainly coloured contemporary opinions about him. He seems a pleasant man, one individual thought cautiously, but a dasher. Others were less easily won over. Opposition politician and lawyer Henry Broom declared, if Popham is not shot, we deserve to be conquered everywhere, both on sea and land and in negotiation. The second reason I've told you this story is because I want to get it out of the way. To put it bluntly, too much emphasis has been placed on Popham's South American adventure when interpreting his life. There is much, much more to him than this mad dash to Argentina to steal some silver. Buenos Aires, by far Popham's loudest and most incredible exploit, should not conceal the surprising versatility of his career. Indeed, Buenos Aires may have been the odd episode out in Popham's life because it was so well publicised. Popham was often employed to do work nobody else wanted to do. Because he did it without asking awkward questions, he was trusted or at least protected, which is not necessarily the same thing, by some of the most important men in British public life. This brings me to my third reason for opening with Popham's court martial. Popham throve on the edge of what was acceptable, legitimate, or even truthful. He was adept at shaping the narrative to his advantage, and nowhere is that better exemplified than in the story of his leaving his court martial to the cheers of people who assumed he'd been acquitted. He had not. Although sentenced only to be severely reprimanded, Popham had, in fact, been found guilty. Controversial, rash, larger than life, all of these terms could certainly describe Popham. Many historians consider him little more than a fraud. My favourite assessment comes from W.H. Fitchett, writing in 1900. Probably no man in that generation got himself talked about so much and did so little. More recently, Roger Knight has described Popham as one of those showy egotists who made fools of themselves. A still more recent article goes further, pillaging the thesaurus to describe Popham as a gambler, a fiddler, a filibuster, a raider, a buccaneer and a freebooter. These assessments are not necessarily wrong, but over insisting on Popham's dubious moral character is too easy. One of Popham's protectors, Lord Moira, described him thus. He is unfortunate about exciting people to lash at him, and yet, with all those injudicious, I can never pronounce that word, injudicious tricks by which he has entailed a host of enemies upon himself, there is essential good in him. He has great professional skill, much readiness of resource and indefatigable activity in working on any subject which attracts his fancy. Material advantage may be drawn from the observations he has treasured up and from his suggestions on most points of service. Moira was wearing exceptionally rose-tinted glasses, but he had identified the reason for Popham's startling longevity. He was useful. He may have concealed what one critic called the superficiality of his achievements behind a misleading plausibility. But if so, he drew in a number of very high-ranking patrons. Popham was not unique. His quixotic schemes and the webs he wove bring to mind naval contemporaries like Sidney Smith and Thomas Cochrane. Unlike Smith and Cochrane, however, Popham started out with few connections, aristocratic, political or naval. His earliest naval patron died in the mid-1780s, leaving him in the lurch. 
instead of struggling solo in the peacetime Royal Navy, Popham left, milked family contacts in the East India Company, and went into business importing luxuries from the East to Europe. This was technically illegal due to the East India Company's trade monopoly, but Popham got away with it by sailing under a variety of different national flags, none of them his own. He also did a bit of smuggling into Britain on the side, which brought his mercantile career to a sticky end. Shortly after Britain went to war with revolutionary France in 1793, Popham's vessel was seized as a prize by a British man of war. Popham, however, was resourceful. He had spent six years living in Ostend. Aware that Britain was fighting France in Flanders, he exploited his familiarity with those waters and his continental networks. By pulling every string within his reach, he managed to get himself restored to the Navy list of lieutenants and an appointment as transport agent in Ostend. This was normally a dead-end job, but Popham was good at getting noticed. Within months, the Duke of York himself had secured him promotion to post captain, and he had attracted the interest of Henry Dundas, Secretary of State for War and Prime Minister Pitt's right-hand man. Under Dundas's patronage, Popham's career blossomed. He may have made his public name facilitating the transportation of British troops across the waterlogged land of Flanders and North Germany, but the services he was now rendering were much more broadly amphibious, I put that in quotation marks. From 1794 on, most of Popham's employment was not merely naval or even uniquely military in character. He collected intelligence from former trading contacts, many of them smugglers, gentlemen of the gin keg, as he delicately described them. He may also have been handling secret service money while superintendent of transports under the Duke of York. This sort of work continued after his return from Flanders. Popham was employed in forming the Sea Fencibles, a volunteer defence force composed of fishermen and other sailors. This was not just a military task. It was also an information gathering exercise and Popham spent much of the first half of 1798 riding around Kent and Sussex, reporting on local attitudes to the government and testing what he called the temper of the people. Popham's delicate past gave him an advantage. Intimate knowledge of the navigation, harbours in Flanders and Holland allowed him to suggest plans for raids on the enemy coast, some of which were put into action. In 1798, Popham oversaw a partially successful amphibious landing to destroy the locks of the Ostend Canal. His knowledge of tropical waters and his family connections with the East India Company also stood him in good stead, particularly with Dundas, who often sought input from Popham on vulnerable places to attack the French in their colonies. Popham's imperial, global, blue water approach with its emphasis on expanding British trade and depriving the enemy of theirs appealed strongly to Dundas, who by 1798 had become Popham's main employer. As before, Popham's character as an amphibious expert was often just an excuse for Dundas to get him out there. In 1799, for example, Popham was sent to Russia, supposedly to organise the transportation of Russian troops to Holland, where Britain and Russia were about to engage jointly in the ill-fated Helder expedition as part of the Second Coalition. In fact, Popham behaved much more like an unofficial ambassador, dealing directly with the notoriously mercurial Tsar Paul, to make sure he didn't change his mind about sending the troops in the first place. Popham was so successful that after relations between Britain and Russia broke down in 1800, he was again sent to St. Petersburg as an unofficial envoy, although this time Paul refused to see him. At the end of 1800, at Dundas's request, Popham was given command of a 50-gun troop ship and sent to carry British troops to Suez so they could participate in the campaign against the French in Egypt. As usual, however, Popham wasn't only there to ferry troops around. He was carrying secret instructions from the East India Company and was appointed by the Governor General of India, Lord Wellesley, as ambassador to the States of Arabia. Popham spent 18 months in the Red Sea area, establishing British factories and assisting local British merchants, although he did not quite manage to make trade treaties further inland. Popham's keenness to please his political masters is easy to understand. His smuggling past was not far behind him, and he needed great names to protect him. As this letter from Dundas shows, he earned that protection. 
I'm well aware that Sir Hume Popham is an object of envy with some, of jealousy with others. But in proportion as he has attempted to be run down, it is the duty of the government to run him up. To the conviction of us all, he has served government many years in various capacities, zealously and well. Anything, therefore, that little jealousness or captious or observations may throw out with regard to Sir Hume Popham individually, I feel perfectly indifferent about. If any person feels the service of working alongside him cumbersome, there will no doubt be many others to supply their places. Popham offered political advice to Dundas and to Pitt when both men were out of office in 1804 and hoping to use the poor states of Britain's naval preparations against invasion to come back to power. Popham's reward was twofold, a seat in the House of Commons and the overturning at last of the Admiralty Court ruling that had condemned his old smuggling vessel as a legitimate prize. Popham received £18,000 in compensation. Small wonder then that by 1804 Popham was hoping for a seat on the Admiralty Board. Small wonder also that he had made a number of high-placed enemies. Lord St Vincent, first Lord of the Admiralty between 1801 and 1804, instigated a series of inquiries into naval corruption and Popham fell foul of this. He was cleared of financial misconduct by Parliamentary Committee, twice in fact, and protected as he was by great men, he probably thought he had little to fear. By misfortune, however, he lost his two most significant patrons in 1805 and 1806, Pitt to death, Dundas to political disgrace. Although he continued to be employed by Pitt's political disciples, there were, these were new faces and Popham's continued favour depended on his performance. The failure to live up to expectations was probably what destroyed him. Buenos Aires was a gamble that went very wrong. He survived to serve as captain of the fleet at Copenhagen in 1807, but several naval contemporaries refused to serve under him. The appointment of a man found guilty of disobeying orders they felt was, quote, pregnant with such evils to the naval services, even to threaten its total annihilation. In 1809, the government called on Popham's knowledge of Dutch waters in planning the disastrous Walcheren expedition. This failure was the mistake his enemies had been waiting for and Popham now also lost the goodwill of his protectors. Although he did spend six months off the north coast of Spain in 1812, facilitating Wellington's communications and harrying French troops in the area, it was his last active service. In 1817, he was sent to Jamaica. Some viewed this appointment as a second acquittal from his court martial, but it killed two of his children, and in 1820, it pretty much killed him too. This gallop through Popham's career, I hope, explains why I have described his life and not just his area of expertise as amphibious. In an age where there were no firmly established ways for decision makers to consult on strategy and military matters, Popham was able to carve himself a special niche. Despite remaining a captain for nearly the entire period between 1793 and 1815, his curriculum vitae included military planning, amphibious operations, intelligence and undercover operations, diplomacy, politics, and scientific discovery. His most enduring legacy is as a hydrographer and as the inventor of a telegraphic code used by the Royal Navy for well over a century. He served across huge swathes of the globe, from Flanders, Holland, Copenhagen, Spain, to South America, India, and the Cape of Good Hope. Because Popham started out with comparatively few connections, he had to make his own networks. These were not, by and large, traditional naval ones. Most of his employment came from the foreign and war departments rather than from the Admiralty. His Navy peers indeed viewed him with jaundiced eyes. One wrote, and I'm not even going to attempt the accent on this, I can never think of him without bringing to mind the showman's description of the hippopotamus. This ear is the hippopotamus or river horse, an amphibious animal, what cannot live on the land and what dies in the water. But Popham was a survivor who built a career out of highlighting strategic opportunities, obstacles and solutions, and telling the politicians what they wanted to hear. His patrons were impressed by his constant willingness to go the extra mile, sometimes by anticipating orders or interpreting them creatively, but usually by fully embracing the seedier side of warfare. In return, they blinked at his occasional indiscretions and helped him throw a veil over his questionable past. 
Crucially, though, Popham was a skilled self-publicist. His entire life involved controversy and contradiction, and he courted it because it was good for him. From the moment he stepped onto the public stage in 1793 to the moment he left it, he made sure he was talked about on his terms. He was startlingly good at it, pamphleteering, bombarding his correspondence with a barrage of letters, exploiting connections with the press, speechifying, networking, creating, imagining, outright lying on occasion, but often simply massaging the truth into something more palatable. Popham's war was fought with words and, his, and, and with his brains as much as with guns or tactics. This makes him tremendously difficult to pin down. This is not to say his character is totally beyond grasp. <clears throat> Early in his career, Popham wrote, my lieutenant felt so incompetent to my quicksilver motions that he has written to resign. It was a typical piece of bombast, but an eloquent one. Popham had found the perfect analogy for himself, bright, fluid, silvery fast, but dangerous and unpredictable. Like the mercury in the thermometer, Popham's fortunes either rocketed up or sank to the bottom. This is why he was a scoundrel for all seasons. His survival depended on his being both indispensable and beyond scrutiny. It was only ever a matter of time before Popham's bubble burst. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation. I told you he was delinquent. <laughs> <laughs> Our uh, next presenter is, uh, let's see here. Oh, here he is. Our next presenter is Peter Hicks, who is uh, in many ways the Renaissance man, a polyglot, award-winning writer, historian, choir master, organist, pianist, singer, and the list goes on and on. Today, however, he wears the head of a historian. After completing a degree in classics at the University College London, he studied for his doctorate at the University of Cambridge, St. John's College. He's currently uh, the historian, the chief historian for the Fondation Napoleon, the leading uh, French organization de de devoted to the uh, um, Age of Revolution and Napoleon. Uh, he's also a visiting professor at the University of Bath, uh, director of music at St. George Anglican Church in Paris, and the music director of the Paris Choir Musicanti, which I highly recommend. He sometimes shares and posts his wonderful performances. He has written extensively on the Age of Napoleon and won the Luciano Bonaparte Principe di Canino Prize for the annotated edition of Napoleon's famous novella, Crisson et Eugenie. Today, he will discuss the new discoveries of accounts of Napoleon by British witnesses on St. Helena Island. Without further ado. Peter. Thank you very much, Alex. Delighted to be here. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk to about stuff. I'm going to try to be as brief as I possibly can. I'm not very good at being brief, but I'll do my best. Um, it's the idea is that I'm going to take you through um, one, two, three, four, five of my recent discoveries as regards um, witnesses to Napoleon on St. Helena. Um, we are very rich in accounts of Napoleon at the beginning of his time on St. Helena, and we are very poor for accounts of Napoleon at the end of his time on St. Helena. The pivotal year for the change is probably the expulsion of Barry O'Mara uh, in late July 1818. Uh, Barry O'Mara uh, had been Napoleon's uh, private doctor since he'd been sort of uh, picked off the Bellerophon and introduced into Napoleon's uh, retinue as his private doctor. Obviously he was of great interest to the Admiralty because he was an Anglophone inside Longwood House. Uh, close to Napoleon, with the eminently political information as to how well the emperor was or how poorly. Um, Hudson Lowe came out to St. Helena with his own team, as was traditional. Um, we were just hearing about Home Popham and his uh, his his supporters, his uh, his uh, the people that the eminence grise behind his career. Obviously, uh, Hudson Lowe was the big man and he came out with his team and his doctor was Alexander Baxter. Um, Hudson Lowe wanted to put Baxter in in 
Barry Amara's place. So relations between the two were never particularly cordial. And as Barry O'Mara gradually began to be um, more friendly with the French, uh, he spoke Italian as well as French. Napoleon famously says, your French is much better now. We can really talk um, later on through later, later in 1817. But they most of the time spoke in Italian. Um, so he gradually becomes more friendly with Napoleon. And this obviously is picked up by Hudson Lowe. He starts collaborating with Napoleon, passing letters, helping with publications. And finally, Lowe breaks and says, right, you've got to get out. The, he sends a note to the Admiralty. The Admiralty says, there's no way we're taking him out of there. He's our man inside Longwood House. He stays. So Hudson Lowe was basically countermanded in his demands to get rid of O'Mara to put Baxter in. Unfortunately for O'Mara at that time, uh, the general, General Gogo had been uh, finally decided he wanted to leave St. Helena, abandon being one of the uh, um, followers of Napoleon on St. Helena. And he became very close to various people on the island, notably Hudson Lowe. And then when he got back to London three months later in sort of, um, um, must have been sort of early May, uh, late April, he was debriefed by the Admiralty and he said, well, yeah, Napoleon's in great health. Whereas Barry O'Mara had been telling them that he had been in a pretty bad way and was notably suffering from hepatitis, the disease of the tropics. And if Napoleon was suffering from the disease of the tropics, then sending him to St. Helena was in fact rather like sending him to his death, rather like what the directory used to do with the guillotine sesh. So, it would turn out, it looked like, from what Gorgo was saying, if Napoleon's in great health, Barry O'Mara has been, is not telling the truth. He's saying that Napoleon's got hepatitis, that's wrong. So the minute this, this news arrives on St. Helena, Barry O'Mara is whisked out of St. Helena, taken back to London. Now, what has this got to do with my discoveries? Well, it turns out that uh, I was very generously uh, hosted uh, a visit backstage at the Strozier Library uh, at Tallahassee. And I was taken to see the wonderful collection they have. And uh, as we were like looking at their treasures, they've got some amazing stuff. Um, my eye fell on a little pamphlet, which was a tiré à part, I suppose, a, a, an abstract of a journal, a French journal, published in 1939 with the story of a certain Mr. James Hall. Now, I think, Nobody in France has picked up on this particular account, and nobody in Britain has particularly because it's in French. And although Hall's account had been published in 1926 in English, it had been hidden in private archives of other people more famous than James Hall. And so his account sort of basically had not been seen, even though it had been published. So I looked at this thing. I, I, th I suspect also that the name Hall coincided with one of the members of um, the, the British mission to China when they came back through St. Helena. And as a man at Abel Hall, I think his name was, uh, he wrote um, an account of his visit with Napoleon. And so people just maybe thought it was that hall. Anyway, turns out when you look at this text in, in, in French, it's an account of James Hall and his meeting totally by chance, with Barry O'Mara at the precise moment, the paroxysm of the terrible uh, relationship with Hudson Lowe and the final um, welcoming of Barry O'Mara into the arms of the French emperor. And so Hall's account is quite extraordinary. Not only do we learn from Hall's uh, memoirs that his, uh, we learned that one of the, um, the principal families on St. Helena, the Solomon family, these are people who look after the bank, the shop, they're kind of central, they're the money lenders. Uh, they are related to um, a British sort of spy, a character called Goldsmith. Now, Goldsmith uh, would have worked for Napoleon in the early, uh, early 1800s, 1802, and then he was a bit of a loose cannon and he began working for the British, writing scabrous nonsense about the French imperial family. And so he's a sort of a strange figure. After 1815, he ended up publishing what they call the Anti-Gallican Monitor, 
And the anti-Gallican monitor is usually pretty critical of Napoleon, but it's strange. The anti-Gallican monitor also has the dubious uh, honor of having published coded letters to Napoleon in the newspapers, which were coming out to Napoleon and supposedly being read by him. Now, why um, Goldsmith should want to be publishing coded letters to Napoleon, nobody really knows. But the odd thing is that Goldsmith's coded letters in the anti-Gallican were a part and parcel of the luggage of James Hall, as we discover from James Hall's um, uh, memoirs. And uh, this, of course, is of great interest to Napoleon, great interest to Hudson Lowe, too. And so uh, when we look at the, the memoirs of James Hall, we discover a whole load of extremely interesting background information, which colors the way we see the expulsion of Barry O'Mara and the subsequent relationship that Barry O'Mara and Lowe have with each other. Barry Mara, when he gets back to London, says that Hudson Lowe asked him to perform what we call in French service minimum. In other words, to do the, sin, the bare minimum as far as the, um, the medical services to Napoleon in order to make sure that maybe that he wouldn't live very long. This is, the, this is what Barry Mara says that Hudson Lowe implied in a conversation. And he says it again to James Hall. James Hall writes it down because they meet twice, not only on St. Helena just before Barrio Mara is expelled, but also once again on the island of Ascension, where James Hall is on post. And so this extraordinary moment of uh, this discovery of new information, putting into context the account of Barrio Mara related to the big question, did Hudson Lowe ask Barrio Mara to effectively uh, shorten Napoleon's days? James Hall provides kind of interesting background information, uh, provides proof to certain um, other uh, documents that we had known, uh, but were didn't know what they were, what they really, really meant. There's one famous one, which was found uh, half burnt in the Longwood fireplace uh, after Napoleon had died, after the French had left, Hudson Lowe and his team went in to check it all out. And in the grate was a half burnt letter and this half-burnt letter is also talked about in James Hall's memoirs. So we're clearly dealing with somebody who really was actually at St. Helena in 1818 and not someone who was writing after the event, basing himself on the publications that were to come, notably Barry Amara, but also Las Cas, and then, of course, all the publications post-1823. So this discovery of James Hall is really rather uh, dramatic. Um, the reason I think James Hall was not noticed, first of all, it was hidden in this private publication for the Hall family alone, basically. In any way, the two figures, uh, the other figures in this book dedicated to James Hall are much, much more important. They are, in fact, admirals. And James Hall was merely a humble surgeon on board ship. He had a pretty dodgy career in Australia and then ended up after a medical sort of problem uh, serving as a, as a GP in the home counties in 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 the UK for the rest of his life. So his, the, the, his part uh, in that book is, is, is minimal. What's more interesting still, as is proved by the French publication of 1939, this French translation of Hall's memoirs, this version was given to the French translator in 1939 by descendants of James Hall. And whilst those people who published the account in English, they cut bits out because they didn't think they were interesting, uh, the French publisher of 1939 includes the whole thing. So knowing that when you look at the two, you have to go to the French translation of Hall's memoirs and not the original English in order to get the full story, all these fantastic details about uh, Napoleon, Barry O'Mara, and the final, um, the, the final question, did Lowe ask Barry O'Mara to shorten Napoleon's days? Uh, and there are, this is a document that, that uh, sorry, James Hall describes his meeting with Hudson Lowe. He calls him in, summons him, and gives him a dressing down and says, what's going on? What did you say to O'Mara? And uh, he tells him what O'Mara said to him and writes uh, an affidavit saying, this is what O'Mara said to me. In other words, what you said to O'Mara you want to shorten Napoleon's days. And Hudson Lowe eventually publishes this document in 1824 as part of his, uh, li his legal attack on Barry O'Mara. Uh, but interestingly enough, there are differences in the two texts. So one would imagine that maybe James Hall's version of that letter was possibly more correct than the version finally published 
by Hudson Lowe. So James Hall's memoirs provide a fascinating insight into this crucial battle. One of the reasons why Barry Amara published his account of Napoleon on St. Helena was to attack Hudson Lowe. So uh, James Hall's memoirs in that respect are quite key. So those are the first, that was a, a delightful uh, discovery brought to me by the Strozier Library. So thank you very much, much, very happy about that. Um, I want to move on because I know time is going and I'm, I can talk for England, so I'm not going to. Um, I want to move on to Walter Henry. Walter Henry is relatively well known. He, another doctor, uh, his memoirs run from 1817 through to when he leaves with the Bertrand family on the Camel store ship in um, the late May 1821. So there again, this period when we don't have memoirs for Napoleon on St. Helena, Walter Henry provides us with more information, as did James Hall, as to quite the, what the situation is in formal published memoirs. But my, my discovery of uh, Walter Henry isn't so much related to the rediscovery of his memoirs, but rather the key differences between the two editions of his memoirs. Walter Henry's account is relatively well known. Um, it talks uh, a bit about Omara, quite detailed about Omara, because he knew Omara, and it is clear from their relations that they weren't mates. And so um, it's interesting to see Walter Henry's account. Now, when I looked at the two different publications, Walter Henry, when he left St. Helena, went with the 66th Regiment to Canada, and there he made his life. He married there, formed a family, set up, and naturally, published his memoirs. He thought of himself as a bit of a writer. He had not much to do when he was on St. Helena, so I think he quite enjoyed the time writing. So he published in Quebec in 1839, a book which he called Trifles of the Life of an Officer. And it's charming. He writes his own poetry, but it's, it's, it's a sort of an account, a quite a straightforward, decent account of his life, but what's interesting for Napoleon uh, scholars is, of course, the part that talks about when he was on St. Helena. He has an interview with St. Helena, he describes it in great detail. Um, and then he also describes some of the other figures around this. And then he goes on to talk about Barry O'Mara. And then that's where it gets interesting because when he published in 1839, the book made its way to London where it was read by a very influential and very, um, uh, very much the Napoleon hater. He had been hating Napoleon for 50 years now. Uh, this is 18, in the 1840s, a man called John Wilson Croker. John Wilson Croker was employed by the Admiralty and his father had founded the Quarterly Review as, in, as an organ to fight uh, Napoleon. So John Wilson Croker brought up in a tradition of Napoleon hating, read Walter Henry's book and thought, well, the bits on Napoleon are interesting. Maybe we should have it republished in London. And this is where he brings in uh, Basil Jackson. Now, Basil Jackson, young, uh, young man who went out to St. Helena in Hudson Lowe's team was um, a bit of a fly boy. Um, he was very interested in the ladies. So he's quite busy all over the place. Uh, they find him in uh, walking out with ladies here and there. He also gets particularly related to um, the Comtesse de Montolon, who is the wife of one of Napoleon's uh, um, accompaniers, uh, um, the figures who accompany him up at St. Helena, up at Longwood House on St. Helena. And so Basil Jackson is a, is, is a fly boy. And he's also, we find him in 1841. He hasn't written his memoirs yet, but he is writing the obituary for Hudson Lowe, who dies in 1841. And he says, well, I considered him almost like a father. So Basil Jackson, big mate of um, Hudson Lowe. He worked for him, uh, he was brought out with him age 20 and through the whole period, 1815 to 1821, he basically grew up and was um, his sort of his eyes and ears. He was a bit of a spy on the island. So John Wilson Croker asks Basil Jackson to talk to William Henry and say, listen, can we talk about your book? There's some interesting stuff here. And they, William Henry and Basil Jackson start up a correspondence, obviously William Henry's in Quebec. 
uh, in Halifax, sorry, Nova Scotia. And they, um, they talk and then Henry has another go at his text and he makes it much more positive towards Hudson Lowe. So this second edition, which is published in 1844, is now no longer called the trifles of, a, of, of, of an army and of an army character. It's called events in the life of a military man. So it's got much more formal. And the study of Barry O'Mara and Hudson Lowe is very much more black and white. Hudson Lowe is more sinned against than sinning, and Barry O'Mara is a terrible liar. And so once, so once you know this, once you've spent time studying these two editions, you can see where Basil Jackson has had a go at, William, at Walter Henry to make him change his discourse, to make it a little bit more positive towards Hudson Lowe, a little bit more negative towards Napoleon, and certainly more negative towards Barry O'Mara. So that was one of my uh, major um, discoveries in terms of a very, very long book. But when you look very closely at the two texts published at different times with different titles, you can see the activity of um, changing things as they go along. What's more interesting out of this, perhaps more, even more interesting than all of that, Basil Jackson turns out that he is the eminence grise behind the publication, final publication of the memoirs of Hudson Lowe by Forsyth. He works with the first person who was given that job, who died on the job, and then he works with Forsyth when Forsyth's on the captivity of Napoleon, which is the big defense of Hudson Lowe, is in fact written, thoroughly piloted from backstage by Basil Jackson. And Basil Jackson finally writes his memoirs at the end of his life in the 1880s, uh, where of course, at that point, you're really not sure what is true and what isn't true because he's been so uh, playing fast and loose with all of this stuff for most of his life. Indeed, he even reviews a book that he was mostly largely in charge of creating, saying what a good book it was. So he's kind of not, he's a bit ec economic with the truth. And I'll finally finish up as I think my time is, is gradually wending its way to the end. I just want to talk about three more people, Charles McCarthy, John Ward, and his delightful lady wife, Harriet Ward, nay tidy. John, Charles McCarthy, um, possibly, we don't know, either there are two men called Charles McCarthy or he, the same man is Charles McCarthy. Charles McCarthy would appear to have written a dirge for Napoleon's uh, funeral on St. Helena on the 9th of May, 1821. Uh, and if it's the same Charles McCarthy, then that's great. Uh, and we're hopefully going to be performing, performing this piece for the first time in 200 years at a concert at Les Invalides in several months time. We don't know how COVID is going to let us go forward with that. Anyway, Charles McCarthy had a little notebook and this notebook records what he was doing on St. Helena. It's very, uh, it's not very glorious. It doesn't, it's, it says where he goes when he's ordered to go up, up, up into the hills, when he's ordered to come back down to Jamestown. Uh, he gets to go on a mission to go to Brazil and he describes um, uh, Rio de Janeiro briefly, which is very slightly interesting. It's not a very long passage, but he does have a, a little account of Napoleon lying in state on his bed. And he also says Napoleon died today. And I was on guard of Napoleon's tomb on the 20th of May, 1821. So a nice little piece of history. This document is preserved in a private little, little, little document in, a, in the, um, the, uh, the, re the regimental archives in Wiltshire. Uh, and they very kindly photographed it for me during lockdown and sent me the photograph. So that's a, a, a little small discovery as to uh, Napoleon's, um, Napoleon's final resting place. Uh, the entry for the 9th of uh, May, for example, says he was buried under several uh, weeping willows in the garden of Mr. Talbot beneath Hutt's Gate, which is rather charming and rather touching. And then we have finally, John Ward and Harriet Ward. John Ward ended up as a general, so he had a major military career. But when he was on St. Helena, he was an ensign. And he hadn't yet married Harriet Ward, Harriet Tidy. He met her 10 years later. So uh, the first text that we have discovered from John Ward is on the back of the famous drawing by John Ward of Napoleon on his deathbed. And it's a lovely little text which has never been published before. And it tells uh, says what a beautiful expression Napoleon had on his face, how everybody when they saw him said, oh, how beautiful, um, records the date, and it says how old he was, and it's signed JW. Nice little thing, 
but everybody's seen the front cover, nobody's seen the back cover. So that's a rather nice thing. And finally, Mrs. Uh, Harriet Ward Nay Tidy, she married John Ward in 1828, 1829. She was a soldier's daughter. They uh, went uh, around a bit and then oddly enough, found themselves back on St. Helena in 1839. So John Ward turns out to be one of the only two people in the world ever to have been at Napoleon's funeral and at Napoleon's exhumation. There are only two of them. So John Ward is the, was the other one. Uh, Harriet Ward was, she, got, she was, a, she was a, a published novelist. Her first book was um, a biography of her father. And then she went on to write other things, mostly stories of Africa. Uh, but she gives a lovely little um, vignette of Mrs. M of the Comtesse Bertrand going down to Napoleon's tomb to sit there, and she asks the the sergeant on duty, which turns out to be John Ward, to ask the the diggers to go away so she can sit there quietly on a chair, meditate in front of Napoleon's tomb. This is previously unknown information. So uh, she goes on later on to publish a, a book she sends to Nap Napoleon the Third. Well, actually, you know, Louis Napoleon, Prince President. But anyway, 1851, nice little thing, which she gets even more romantic about. And then finally, at the end of the 19th century, she publishes a longer text, also sourced, of course, from her husband, because she wasn't there in 1821, uh, which talks about her husband helping in the creation of the death mask of Napoleon. So in the end, everything is linked. So I think my time is up, is it not, Alexander? So I've tried to rush you through my, my, my exciting discoveries. I am looking forward to publishing them all in French uh, very soon. So I recommend you all dust off your dictionaries and uh, rush to your nearest purveyor of French books. And uh, you will be able to read all about this in my publication. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, I, uh, that was fascinating. And uh, please, uh, I want to remind the participants that uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the uh, presentation. So make sure you uh, write your questions. I've been receiving some, uh, but if you have any questions, uh, use the chat function to send them to me and I'll, um, I'll make sure that uh, the uh, pre uh, presenters will hear it. Our last presenter for this uh, session is um, Scott Madere. And here it comes. Hold on, where are you, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, well, um, Scott is the uh, PhD uh, candidate at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. And he studies influence of classical antiquity on Enlightenment era militaries. Uh, he has uh, earned a master's degree in military history from Norwich University, and he's actually a fellow of the Masna Society. He is also the president of LSU History uh, Graduate Student Association, and today he will be uh, giving a talk entitled Beyond Bad Poetry, How Frederick the Great's Affinity for Classical Antiquity Shaped His Military Life. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction, and uh, I'll get the uh, uh, get our PowerPoint going right here. There we are. Okay, so uh, first I would like to thank Dr. Mick Baridzi and the uh, Masana Society for hosting this conference and also for funding my research. Your support is very important to me and I want you to know that I'm uh, very honored and proud to be a Masana Fellow. Uh, now, the reason why I'm here today is to demonstrate why Frederick the Great's love for classical antiquity should be taken more seriously um, as a central pillar of his intellectual world rather than a sideshow uh, based on his love for Greek and Roman art and literature. Now this presentation focuses on material that I'm collecting for my dis dissertation, so it's part of a larger examination, but today we're going to concentrate on the years between the Second and the Third Silesian Wars as the basis of discussion. Now, it's my position that Frederick was influenced heavily by his knowledge of the ancient world and his admiration for the cultural and military legacies of ancient Roman Greece. In his role as king, Frederick drew upon a central reserve of examples from classical antiquity, carefully collected and deployed not only to enhance his image as a philosopher king, but to help the Prussian military survive an onslaught of violent reaction to his military adventurism. Now, um, Frederick, I had plenty of problems in the first and uh, second uh, Silesian Wars. Um, some of these problems were common to militaries, uh, of, of all militaries of his time, like the scale of war and the cost of war in Europe. Now, both had grown 
very large by the 18th century, and it was in the best interest of any leader uh, for these wars to be short. Finding and winning a decisive battle was, as a result, very important to Frederick, as Prussia was not a powerful economic entity before the Silesian Wars. Another problem for Frederick and all other commanders was that their troops lacked any distinguishing characteristics from each other. Unlike the ancients, uh, there were no longer any significant regional variations in military units. Uh, Frederick's ability to shorten a war then relied in part on his ability to distinguish his troops in some way from their opposition. So those were the large scale problems, but the first and second Silesian wars revealed a few weaknesses specific to the Prussians. Their discipline in the first Silesian war was good, but not to the point where Frederick was satisfied. This was particularly evident during Frederick's first battle at Mollwitz in which his cavalry was caught at a standstill by their Austrian counterparts. And Frederick himself was caught in the chaos of troops who were firing without orders. Frederick fled the field to save his life and miraculously the Prussians won anyway. In this and other battles, particularly in the Second Silesian War, the Prussians won because of their discipline. While it wasn't perfect, it was sufficient, underscoring the prominence of that military virtue to Frederick. In both wars, Frederick had the difficulty of preserving his supply lines, which were under constant attack from Austrian light infantry. Desertion was also a major problem for Frederick as seen by the loss of almost 20,000 troops during an ill-fated march into Bohemia during the Second Silesian War in 1744. Uh, the losses to desertion were due to a breakdown of supply and discipline that led to the open questioning of Frederick's leadership among the officers and troops. The biz biggest success for Frederick in either war was uh, the Battle of Hohenfriedberg in 1745, which was the first example of Frederick implementing something like what would become his signature tactic, the oblique order, which we'll examine more closely in a few minutes. Now, this battle came at a time when Frederick desperately needed a decisive win, and this particular battle was the closest he came to forcing his enemy to the peace table after a convincing victory. Frederick took advantage of this rare large scale battle and used his preferred way of fighting and a classically inspired maneuver to assure victory when he needed it most. Hohenfriedberg was followed by two smaller clash clashes, both of which um, uh, were Prussian wins, but one of them exposed another problem for Frederick at the Battle of Soar. Frederick, Frederick's forces were surprised in camp. The Prussians recovered in enough time to win that battle as well, but it wasn't easy. Peace with Maria Theresa came later in 1745 at Christmas and Frederick emerged from the first two wars, the battle ma tested master of Silesia. But Frederick had no doubt that war would come again. Frederick had to evaluate his military's performance in these critical years following the first two Silesian wars and find areas of improvement. First, Frederick made civil, legal, and economic improvements on the home front to make his army better supplied and better able to withstand prolonged conflict. But Frederick made adjustments within his military on the theoretical and practical level in the interwar years, and many of his solutions had a distinct classical influence. Here we see Frederick's intellectual worlds coming together harmoniously. Conventional military wisdom came to coexist with the classically inspired sphere of ideas that marked Frederick's personal life. Frederick's writings and actions reflect that merging of philosophy, and the most important evidence of this was Frederick's general principles of war which appeared in 1748. This particularly revealing document collects Frederick's thoughts on warfare carefully recorded at an important time in his development as commander. In general principles, Frederick attempts to describe the methods and philosophies of a perfect general. Frederick, like other enlightened thinkers, believed in the applicability of universal principles to all situations. Accordingly, if a set of rules worked for one general under similar circumstances, reason dictates that they should work for another. Like many other thinkers of the Enlightenment, this not only applied to contemporary ideas, but ancient ones as well. When Frederick describes the ideal general, he describes a man who is willing to accept his philosophy first and foremost. He writes, a perfect captain is a being of reason. Perfection is in incompatible in all ways with humanity, but the feeling of our imperfection should not prevent us from tracing perfect models so that these generous souls animated by a principle of honor and emulation may approach it in part, but they cannot imitate it in the whole. But who were Frederick's models at this critical moment in his reign? General principles shows that classical antiquity was perhaps the most important archive from which Frederick drew his examples and formed many of these principles that he considered to be universal. 
Particularly important for Frederick's general principles was Vigetius's De Re Militari, which general principles echoes both in spirit and substance. It should be noted that Frederick's library inventory at Potsdam shows three different editions of that work on his shelves, 1743, 1757, and 1772. The first similarity before, between these two works is that Frederick and Vergetius endorsed the activity of historical modeling itself. Vegetius looked back to the best methods, methods of past leaders like Cato the Censor, Cornelius Celsus, and Frontinus, along with Paternus, Augustus, and Trajan as examples for emulation. And likewise, Frederick thought that the military writers of the past could help his Prussian army of the 18th century. He says, I have merged into this work the reflections I have made and those that I have found in the writings of the greatest generals. Now, both writers could have gone without mentioning that they drew upon past resources to develop their military guidebooks, most likely no one would have noticed, but neither one did. In fact, both made a point to demonstrate that they were using the past as a guide, assuming thereby that readers would share their belief in the utility of historical examples and that the past held credibility. In general principles, Frederick made it easy for the reader to spot what he believed was the most important contribution that the ancient world had to offer modern times in the very first paragraph. He says, the wars I have fought have given me the opportunity to reflect deeply on these principles. Roman discipline has only existed with us in the same way by following their example, war should be a meditation for us in peace and exercise. So right away, we see Frederick's two greatest military concerns in the year 1748 laid bare, discipline and preparation. First, Frederick thought that discipline, specifically Roman discipline, was a unique trait of his Prussian army among the militaries of Europe. Frederick viewed discipline as the core value of a successful military, the quality from which all martial abilities flow. The Romans, and in particular Vegetius, provided Frederick with the central model for the kind of discipline that he wanted to instill in his Prussian army, something Frederick would emphasize in many other texts throughout his life. The second concern of Frederick made apparent in his passage is that the Prussian king did not want to waste this period of peace between wars with Austria. According to Frederick, peace should be an exercise and not a rest. In general principles in 1748, he wrote, I will never forget what Vegetius said of the Romans. Finally, the Roman discipline triumphed over the tall stature of the Teutons, the strength of the Gauls, the cunning of the Greeks, so much does the welfare of states depend on the discipline of the armies. Now we're gonna run through this quickly to show you that he repeats this over and over from the 1740s to the 1770s, just two years earlier in 1746. He says what Vegetius says about the Romans, their discipline made them triumph over the tricks of the Greeks, the strength of the Germans, the stature of the Gauls. In 1752, in peace, says Vegetius, this art must be studied and used in war. Discipline is the soul of the armies. One only needs to read what Vegetius has to say about the Roman militia. In 1758, Vegetius says war should be a study for us in peace and exercise. He is right. In 1775, as said Vegetius, peace became a school for the Prussian armies and a war and war a practice. General principles formalizes the adaptation of Roman discipline as a model with the goal of making Frederick's troops more resistant to desertion, more competitive against similarly equipped forces, and more capable of defeating a force that outnumbered them. Regarding the specific problem of desertion, Frederick's most direct solution in general principles was to treat his soldiers on campaign almost like prisoners, um, with guards and patrols constantly on the lookout for runners. But another more subtle solution of Frederick's resembles the advice of Vegetius, whose solution to curb desertion, mutiny, and sedition was intense physical exercise and constant drill. Vegetius warned that it was necessary for the officers to keep up so strict a discipline as to leave them no room to harbor any thoughts but of submission and obedience. According to Vegetius, a well-trained, exhausted group would be inspired with emulation for glory and eagerness for action. Frederick echoed Vegetius' suggestion for curbing chaos in the ranks of general principles. He says, most of an army is made up of an indolent people. He wrote, if the general is not ceaselessly on their tail, the whole machine so ingenious and perfect will quickly break down. It is therefore necessary to get used to working without ceasing. And those who will do it will see from their experience that it was necessary and that there are abuses to be repressed every day. 
Like Vegetius, Frederick endorsed working his men to exhaustion, but also like Vegetius, he realized the upshot of Roman style discipline. He says, although this painful and continual application seems hard, provided a general has it, he is only to be rewarded for it. And what advantages of troops so swift, so brave, so well-disciplined, they do not give him over to his enemies. What would be done with such well-disciplined troops? Frederick saw in the Roman model the, the potential to address problems related to disorder and simultaneously understood the effect that constant activity would have on his troops. They would be better trained than the armies of their neighbors, more physically fit, better able to handle light infantry harassment, and less likely to desert. There are other specific ways in which general principles resembles de re militari, particularly concerning specific advice regarding not being surprised while on campaign and advice on entrenching camps. Frederick even goes so far as to say that camps should be entrenched in the Roman style to prevent desertion. This next bit of classical theming is itself of a problem at all, but rather a victory. As we mentioned in the Second Silesian War, Frederick used a proto-oblique order to help him achieve a convincing win over a numerically superior force at Hohenfriedberg. The oblique order itself is nothing new. Frederick did not invent it, and some historians have suggested that Frederick drew his inspiration from the, for the oblique order from French generals and military theorists like Condé, Turin, Follard, Fouquet, and the Italian theorist Montecuccoli. Alongside the fact that these modern generals and theorists may have been inspired by antiquity as well, it is for certain that none of them invented the oblique order either. That was an ancient innovation of a Theban general Epaminondas at the Battle of Lyctra in 371 BCE. Now Epaminondas' student of war, Philip of Macedon, also implemented the tactic and so did the son of Philip, Alexander the Great. It's safe to say that Frederick being an admirer of all three men was well aware of the usage of this particular battle tactic in both ancient and modern times. And Frederick was very well read. It's likely that Frederick understood both the ancient and modern references to the oblique order and certainly being influenced by one period does not negate being influenced by any other. But the intellectual path connecting Frederick to the ancient world was well-formed and well-worn, especially when it came to topics mentioned by Vegetius. So it should come as no surprise then that the oblique order is prominently mentioned in both Vegetius's De Real Militari and Frederick's general principles. Vegetius writes, the second and best disposition is the oblique, for though your army consists of few troops, Yet good and advantageously posted, it will contribute to your obtaining victory, notwithstanding the numbers and bravery of the enemy. Your left wing must be kept back. Your right wing must advance obliquely, and you must surround the wing with which you're engaged, make it give way and fall upon the enemy in the rear. You will undoubtedly gain the victory while your left wing, which continued at a distance, will remain untouched. Now, Frederick's general principles also mentions how we can beat the enemy with unequal forces. This is particularly important for Frederick. He knew that Prussia could be outnumbered in battle by the armies of empires like Austria, Russia, and France. And Frederick knew that replacing a fallen soldier was more difficult for Prussia than her enemies due to the investment of training that Frederick placed in that soldier. Therefore, a formation that emphasized the survivability of troops appealed to Frederick. He says, my oblique order of battle can be employed very usefully. We refuse a wing to the enemy, and the one who is to attack is to be fortified. You make your efforts on the wing of the enemy, which you take in the flank. If you are beaten, only part of your army has been beaten, and three quarters fresh troops are used to retreat. We also know that Frederick owned a copy of Diodorus Siculus's Universal History. It's dated 1743, two years before the Battle of Hohenfriedberg, in which Epaminondas' first use of the oblique order at the Battle of Lyctra is described in detail. Here you see again, we selected from the entire army the bravest men stationed them on one wing, the weakest placed on one wing in an oblique formation, the Boeotians retreated on one wing, but on the other engaged the enemy in double quick time. Uh, the heavy column led by Epaminondas bore down on the Lacedaemonians and the army turned and fled en route. Now, that doesn't mean that Frederick read Diodorus and ran to Hohenfriedberg to use what he learned from Epaminondas. It simply means that Frederick used Epaminondas' experiences to inform his own thinking about what to do in a similar situation. That's influence, but it is useful and not trivial influence. So who exactly was Epaminondas to Frederick? One year 
After writing general principles, Frederick wrote a poem called The Art of War to celebrate some of the classical and model modern heroes that came to shape the warfare of his time. In the 1749 work, which was edited by Voltaire, Frederick uses the style of Ovid to praise heroes like Caesar, Pompey, Fabius, and Hannibal uh, throughout. And he uses his verse dedicated to Epaminondas, the creator of the oblique order. He says, Greece was the first to plant our laurels. Sparta was the cradle of the school of warriors. They were once born order and discipline, the phalanx of the Thebans owed its origin. Miltiades, Chimon, wise Epaminondas, you made heroes of your lesser soldiers. And here's the oblique order reference, art substituted for numbers. So if you read a little further, you can also see Frederick's lament of the collapse of Roman discipline later in the poem. He says, but this discipline and fruitful victories who made them get to the point of their greatness was under the last Caesars, not in force. Frederick's poem is much more than hero worship. If you read closely, the art of war actually tips the reader to important themes emphasized in Frederick's technical military writings, and the oblique order is only one of them. He is sharing and promoting the idea that ancient wisdom is still useful in a military sense, and this sharing of knowledge is what the Enlightenment is all about. But all the fancy reading and writing in the world will do no good if it doesn't translate to the battlefield. And Frederick spent the years between 1746 and 1757 teaching his army to implement the virtues that he promoted in his interwar writings. The discipline he admired from ancient Rome was strengthened on the drill ground in those years as Frederick personally oversaw training and war maneuvers intended to strengthen both bodies and willpower. The oblique order was made possible by the strengthened discipline and focus on movement and formation. Frederick's men practiced, quote, holding back one wing while attacking and enveloping the enemy with the other, refining the process until it became practically useful on the battlefield. They also implemented cadence marching, an art form lost from ancient Rome, brought back to life in Prussia in the 1730s by King Frederick William, who was, of course, Frederick's father. The Third Silesian War followed these critical years of military thinking and drilling in Prussia starting in 1756. The second year of the war featured the masterpieces of Frederick's career just a few weeks back. Uh, you see the, a few weeks apart, you see the battles of Rosbach and Luthen uh, there on the screen in which uh, Frederick's highly disciplined troops ex executed the oblique order to its most artful degree. But war was not without its share of difficulties for Prussia, particularly in the later years when the Prussian ability to maintain a viable army was stretched to the breaking point. World events outside of Prussia, diplomacy and luck had as much to do with the Prussian victory as its campaign performance. Prussia simply outlasted Maria Theresa's will to, to retake Silesia in the end, underscoring one of the most important truths about modern warfare in particular, the collective willpower of the state is perhaps the most important factor when it comes to winning or losing. But Frederick comes from a time when it seemed that the solutions for many problems, military or not, could be derived or discovered from the past as a process of reasoning. It's to Frederick's credit as an enlightened mind that his pool of inspiration went deeper than many expected. And it's my hope that we can view that inspiration as applying to more than just Frederick's allegedly bad poetry. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I want to bring all the speakers on screen. There we go. So now you should be. And um, we have a few questions, and I encourage the, partic uh, the participants to, uh, um, to send me uh, more, and we'll try to get through them. Um, the first question is for Dr. Reiter, uh, uh, and it's from Ryan Diamond. And he asks, I have the impression that Popham seemed widely disliked among his peers in the Navy, but seemed much more palatable to the army. Is that perception right? And if so, why was Popham one of the army's favorite naval officers? Mm. I think that's a, a fair impression, to be honest. Um, he, uh, he was probably more familiar to uh, the army than he was to the Navy because he spent more time working with them. Um, he, uh, as I think I said in my talk, he got most of his employment through Dundas, who was Secretary of State for War, um, and a lot of that involved amphibious operations, so obviously he had to deal with the army quite a lot. Um, he was usually the 
you know, uh, the main naval man on site. Uh, there was an admiral who was um, in command of the area. Generally, Popham skipped straight past the admiral and went straight to Dundas or to the admiralty to report, which um, didn't make him any more loved, let's put it that way. Um, so I think that's probably where most of it comes from. Um, he did have quite a lot of uh, um, contacts in the army. Um, I, I alluded to this uh, Buenos Aires jaunt. Um, two prominently involved um, army men, and that was uh, David Baird, who was the Cape governor, and um, uh, Beresford, um, who commanded the, uh, the, the troops who were captured at Buenos Aires. Both men went quite a long way back with Popham, particularly Baird. Um, so uh, there's quite a lot to unpick, um, but yes, I mean, I think it's definitely fair to say that he was more a naval, uh, I mean, an army um, employee than a naval one, which is very ironic. Um, the next question is for uh, uh, Dr. Hicks. Um, it comes from Marcus Cribb, and um, he wants to know if you plan to publish this book in English in French, when, how? <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah, my, the book I'm, I'm, is, is coming out in French at the end of this year. Um, its appearance in English uh, depends on a publisher picking it up. Um, That's very disappointing, Peter. <laughs> I, well, I, I, as, as you were saying earlier, I never work in France, my world is French. Uh, the French are particularly, uh, in, we're publishing a lot of Napoleonica this year. The, the, the big difference, I think, oddly enough, between the centenary and the bicentenary, the centenary, definitely English language publishing, won the battle completely hands down. The big books that we've all been using on St. Helena were all published during the first centenary. Um, that's not the case for the second centenary. The second centenary, the big books have all been published in French. The, the manuscript of Lascaz, the new edition of Gorgo, now François Houtsec has just recently published the latest, the, the best edition of the last 200 days of Napoleon's life from the memoirs of Bertrand. Um, you know, uh, there's a, a lot of stuff being published and, and, and my, my books are modest sort of uh, stone in, on, on the pile. But uh, I think what's interesting of it particularly is bringing English language material to a Francophone public. Mm -hmm. But it, it, down the road, the plan hopefully is to make it well, I, more I, widely I publish, I publish an awful lot in English, uh, quite often on specific subjects related to St. Helena, notably via our website, napoleon.org. Uh, and I will carry on doing that, um, short mm -hmm. passages that are related to specific questions that, mm -hmm. that spin off my research. Um, but uh, yes, I think there's a lot to be learnt about the British reaction to Napoleon on St. Helena via my research. So yes, I would strongly recommend the publisher pick it up. <laughs> um, we have a, a couple of questions uh, for uh, Scott and um, maybe I can, I can combine them. One is uh, short and, and easy one. <laughs> okay. uh, it is, um, uh, have you published this presentation? Uh, Ivan uh, Ordones wants to know, and if not, how he can get a copy of it? Uh, well, uh, uh, I haven't published it uh, yet. It's part of my dissertation research, and well, that's chapter one of the, <laughs> <laughs> of the dissertation. So, Hold so on. It's, 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 it's getting the ball rolling. On, it's not on the, the only chapter, chapter that you finished, though, right? <laughs> uh, no, it's yeah. It's, there's 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 plenty plenty more. Yeah, but we if you if you'd like to get a, a copy of it, I'll, I'll I can uh, shoot my uh, my email in the uh, uh, in the chat here, and uh, that way. Um, uh, I'll, I'll put it in just a second and, and just shoot Wonderful. me an email. I'll be happy to share that uh, with you. And, and thank uh, you for your interest in my topic. I appreciate it. The other question is from a person uh, who didn't identify himself fully. Okay. So I'm going to just pose it <laughs> by that. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for your presentation. What about the other military leaders of the Enlightenment? Can we see a similar affinity for classical antiquity among other senior generals? Mm -hmm. Uh, can we trace it among uh, lower rank officers and what's the connection to Napoleon? Yeah, so uh, so one of the things that, that I'm hoping to do with this particular dissertation is sort of to expand on military enlightenment studies and to, as a secondary goal, 
to uh, present it as more of an international movement as opposed to simply just relating to France. So we actually started with uh, Frederick because source wise, you know, his all of his works are online. So not being able to travel right now, you know, this is it's it's a lot easier to to work with Frederick right now. And he's the he's the low hanging fruit. So so we started with him first. Uh, we have other chapters playing in my dissertation for um, uh, French military theorists and, and their uh, uh, their officers, and you know, finding the seeds of classical influence uh, there. We're also looking um, at English sources, and even you know, kind of hoping that maybe we can find a thing or two about uh, American revolutionary forces as well. Um, how this relates to Napoleon? Now, of course, Napoleon had a great affinity for um, Roman culture in, in particular. And um, that is not because Napoleon is such a huge topic. He's he's actually going to be covered in a, a later work. Uh, 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 I've not yet begun to fight on this topic, <laughs> and uh, and I've got a I've got a, 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 a you know a good five chapters to start with in this uh, um, uh, 18th century leading up to Napoleon, and um, I I will absolutely uh, commit to a follow-up work on uh, the Napoleonic period as well. That question is for uh, uh, Peter. Um, what's your opinion on Napoleon's last days, asks Bryce Mary. Was, did he die of neglect? Of, uh, was he just neglected to death? Was he murdered? No, no, no of course he wasn't murdered. No, no, no. I think what, what happened, well, um, basically it's, I suppose with these days we call it medical malpractice, but um, I don't think uh, people Obviously, medicine was not quite as advanced in those days. He was given a super big dose of calomel, which finished him off. Um, uh, it was, they didn't know. I mean, he did have incipient stomach cancer and he had a hole in his stomach, which was um, blocked by a slightly swollen liver. Um, and so he was not a well man. Um, and, uh, and he'd been getting worse over the years to... 1820, 1820, but by the time he gets 21, he doesn't eat the house. He can't hold anything down. He can only eat jellies. Um, I think the, the, the nonsense about the poisoning has been really basically been put to bed. I don't think there's any reason. The problem with the poisoning is trying to find a motive and no one's really got a motive. Um, so there and we the go. trans memoirs that Francois just uh, published uh, give us a, a great insight into this last, what, 200, days of his health and experience and including what well, you mentioned right what, what happens yeah the difference between the original publication of Bertrand's memoirs and this publication is uh the the previous editor left bits out and That's bits right. that he couldn't read De Bertrand is famous for having tiny little handwriting and a special sort of code in which he writes it's not it's not like a hidden code but it's like a sort of tachygraphy uh, and Francois had worked on the correspondence of Napoleon for 15, 17 years. He's, he's worked a lot on Napoleon's handwriting. It's good. If you want to learn how to read coded handwriting, try reading Napoleon's handwriting. Um, so yes, so he was very, very good. There's a lovely letter by Napoleon, which says that uh, he's writing to somebody else. He says, the passage that you couldn't read in my last letter was Bataillon Suisse. Um, so that's <laughs> just delightful, delightful. Even he knew his handwriting was illegible. Um, but Bertrand takes illegible and runs with it. So yeah, that's, 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 that's a new version of that. Uh, so Forsberg's work is amazing. I mean, he still has the square brackets with the dots in the middle because there's bits yeah. you just can't see. Yeah, um, he occasionally sent me some of the passages, and indeed, I, indeed, I, I was very tempted to send him a bottle of wine <laughs> so yeah, he can drown it. <laughs> It's pretty um, scary stuff, but he's done an amazing job. And so the, the version that Francois has published is now the completest version of the memoirs of Bertrand, which have never been translated into English. Uh, they were the first editions were published in the 1950s, uh, remained in French. Um, next question is for uh, Dr. Reiter. Uh, we, uh, the first one comes from uh, Claudio Mann, whose uh, uh, presentation we've listened to earlier today from the University of North Texas. And he asks, to which extent do you believe that Popham acted on his own initiative to conduct the expedition to Buenos Aires? You knew it, it was coming, right? <laughs> you, yes, I, you knew. Know I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Um, well, uh, <laughs> oh crikey. Um, well, the gosh, um, I would say that... <sighs> well, let me, let me tell you the second yes. part of that. So this way you, yes. you'll have a second to think because... Uh, uh, Mr. Mann also wonders, could it be that he was induced by London MPs 
Or was he under orders from members of government who deserted him when the expedition faced a defeat? Um, I think that the second part is a little easier because the administration that was actually in, in power when um, Popham was court-martialed was not the administration that would have sent him out um, because that was the, uh, the talents um, who were actually Pop Popham's political enemies, technically, um, Pitt having died in 1806. So um, I'm not sure that I, I think it's probably part of the reason why he was actually brought to court martial. One part, not all of it. Um, there's a reason he was found guilty. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to throw my hat in the ring here and say that I have a slight suspicion that there's a little bit more to Popham going to Buenos Aires than just him suddenly waking up one morning and deciding, oh, I'd really like to steal some silver. Um, and uh, a lot of the books that deal with the Buenos Aires um, ex expedition um, pick up the story in about 1806 or 1805 sometimes, if you're very lucky. Um, very few of them actually <laughs> sort of go back and trace the fact that Popham was intimately involved with um, Miranda, um, who had been planning uh, various harebrained schemes um, for some time. And of course, there's also a chron chronological issue here, which is that um, Britain and Spain weren't at war until the end of 1804. So a lot of this had been meditated long before Britain and Spain actually went to war. So there is something when Popham stands up and gives his long four hour speech, four hour speech <laughs> in his defense. Um, I, I did mention he liked to talk, didn't I? Um, part of his, um, his thrust is, I was implicitly meant to do this. Um, and uh, he gets Melville or Dundas, as uh, um, I called him during my talk to avoid confusion, he gets Dundas to turn up and speak in his defence. He gets various other um, government people up onto the stand to speak in his defence, and they all give the same story, which is essentially, no, we didn't give him orders in so many words. <laughs> um, and you can read a lot into that. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to categorically say anything at this stage. But I don't think that, you know, I, 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 th I think Popham probably stretched what he was supposed to do. Um, I don't think Melville told him go to Buenos Aires and steal all the silver. Um, but I think probably that a lot of what was discussed was done in conversation. And it's going to be very difficult to prove either way what happened. Um, to be honest, this is the story of Popham's life and is, is partly the reason why <laughs> I spent most of the last year tearing my hair out. But um, I'm afraid that's all I can give you right now. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say... But you will give us the definitive <laughs> answer in the book. Well, here's hoping. <laughs> if they can be open the archives, that would be a massive boon. <laughs> Our next question is for uh, uh, Scott, um, and it comes from a fellow graduate of the Norwich University, uh -huh. Phil Matthew. Very nice, um, good uh, Who also <laughs> uh, earned an MA in history. And his question is, you probably read the book Scipio uh, Africano's Greater Than Napoleon by Little Hart. Uh, do you agree with the premise of that book? Uh, that book, uh, actually, I have not read. If you could tell me the premise of it, maybe I could. <laughs> <laughs> well, really I think the premise is in the title that, you know, the, uh, the, the great hero of the antiquity oh. being greater than the here, you know, the great commander of uh, modernity, kind of. Oh, okay. Uh, so, well, uh, uh, if I if we're talking about a comparison between Scipio Africanus and, and Napoleon, is, is that... Uh, uh, with the, uh, the the premise was that the ancient was greater than the than the modern. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, no, I wouldn't agree with that at all. Uh, I, <laughs> I think that Napoleon was a was a. Uh, this is my personal view. Is uh, honestly, I, I think that Napoleon was a, was a singular uh, genius and per, you know per, perhaps the uh, um, you know the the most uh, competent and uh, skilled general of, of all of world his all of world history. Um, um, I think that Scipio is also a gifted commander, but um, um, 
I, I had to rank the two of them. I'd put Napoleon ahead. <laughs> I th- he'd be the guy I would choose to lead my army. I'll just put it to you. No, that's that's a good 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 conversation kind of piece because I see some, yeah. you know, especially in later years, Napoleon is clearly not not uh, not on the on on the same level. Well, that's where you can clearly you know see Scipio's brilliance and. Mm-hmm. Because he stays victorious to the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and, and uh, you know, he he did what what he. I think you know one thing that he he definitely uh, did have was uh, an arch enemy, right? You know that that is uh, uh, of led rightfully so of, of legendary caliber, you know, in Hannibal, and you know with the the, the showdown at the Battle of Azama, you beat him head to head, you know now. You know, can can the same thing be said of Napoleon? Mm-hmm. You know, who's yeah. who's his arch enemy? You know, and did did he win the showdown with him at Waterloo? Um, well, you know, maybe not. Peter, we have a question that again from a, a person that did not identify um, fully, but the question is: Is there anything else left unexplored on the Saint Helena question? Well, I keep finding it, so there must be, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I, was, I was amazed to find how much in my book that is still in the state of manuscript. Uh, um, the listing of the things that I'm publishing, there's uh, Ibbotson. Ibbotson is the commissioner, the, the commissaire. He looks after provisions on the island for, uh, helps out providing food for, for, um, for payment for Longwood House. And he wrote a little diary. This diary was sold at auction in uh, 2012, went into private hands, but the auction house was happy to pass on the details. It was badly translated into French, um, wasn't an English version. So I redid the transcription of the French. Um, there's, some, there's a lovely, lovely moment where Napoleon baits the people around him. He says, hang on, isn't that word mistress in English? Doesn't that mean whore as well as miss? Uh, and he's trying to poke his English people around him, and and and, uh, and Madame 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 Montalon, who is a bit of a goer, it must be said. I'm sorry to say that, but anyway, she is the the, the, the Comtesse de Montalon. There we, there we go. Not to be sexist, but uh, she she says Ibbotson says she says uh, a whore is a lady who's a little bit too much comme ça, and she does a gesture with her hands, which I don't know what the gesture is, but um, this was seen as such a racy part of his diary, clearly someone stuck some pages over it, because you can see the glue still on the manuscript. Anyway, that was kind of fun, so that was fun. Um, I just recently discovered something, um, a book of, that was, this stuff is often published, but published in obscure journals, the Journal of Scottish Studies in the 1920s, published the account of this bloke's visit to St. Helena on the way back from somewhere. And uh, the manuscript turns out is at the National Maritime Museum. I wrote, I rang them and said, uh, in lockdown, you know, I, I really need a copy. And they, they really, really kindly sent me the thing. So there, and, and the version published in the Scottish Journal in 1920 is not as complete as the full text. So I was able to add extra stuff to that. This is another uh, character who's passing through, sees Napoleon, says what happens, re- recounts the people around him, full of extra details. Um, so yeah, there must be. I'm. I'm really. I would love to find out where's where Barry O'Mara's uh, notebooks are. They were. I've tracked them down to 1903 in America. Um, there were 19 of them, um, and um, they own. They don't. They were published. The first two of his notebooks were published by Century Magazine in over the period 1900 in three successive, successive numbers. But the notebooks three to 19 are still out there in the undergrowth. Um, and I'd also like to see Dr. S- Dr. John Stokoe's memoirs. Dr. S- John Stokoe's memoirs were, were published by a Frenchman. Um, then his, the, the lady who'd given the Frenchman, Paul Frimmel, that she'd given him her ancestors' memoirs. He translated them to French. What she did for publishing was she then took the French translation and translated that back into English. I mean, go, go <laughs> figure. But anyway, so I don't know why that happened, but it did. Uh, anyway, so John Stokoe's memoirs, I don't know. He, she, the, the Fremo says he was very verbose and he had to rewrite it a bit, which is a very bad sign. And I think that suggests that Fremo had a go and changed what he was writing. Um, I mean, there's a lot of people playing fast and loose with this stuff. I noticed Betsy Balcom's memoirs, when they were translated into French, the guy writing the French ha- went completely off, off the planet. There's a famous moment where, he, where Betsy Balcom is singing Ye Banks and Braes to Napoleon, which is a beautiful moment. And, uh, 
And the French translator adds the fact, adds it, it's not in Betsy Balcom's original, says she was playing the harp. And I was like, no, no, she was probably playing the piano or she might have been playing the guitar, but she wasn't playing the harp, you know, and, and this is- so uh, You gotta give him, that's a nice gesture there. It's a nice touch. It's lovely, but you know, 19th century standards of translation, you know, they're not, they're not, not what they, what they ought to be really. Let's we it. have one minute uh, left. And I do want to mention, uh, since we're talking about St. Helena Island, that uh, our uh, colleague, Pierre Branda, just published a wonderful a study, uh, Napoleon or uh, Saint Helena. Uh, it's in French, unfortunately, but <laughs> but <laughs> learn French. Learn French. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, I got a copy, but of course, uh, for uh, for many of us who are listening here from the English speaking world, uh, I think we'll have to wait for the English translation unless uh, we, we are um, uh, you know willing to to read it in original French. But it's a wonderful book, a sizable, and it taps. Uh, the most recent historiography of it. We have one more question, and I think it's a nice way to end it because uh, the person who asked it, uh, a good friend, Jimmy Chan, uh, he himself put it, it, this is a silly question, but <laughs> what a better way than to end on that note. And it's for Jacqueline. <laughs> and he says, the UK government likes to talk all about Nelson and Churchill, but do you agree that home pop him is a far more appropriate symbol for post-Brexit global Britain. <laughs> oh, I'm so going to find you, Jimmy. <laughs> your, your number's up. Uh, no. <laughs> the answer. <laughs> um, well, no, not really. Um, I don't think I'd use a problem as a symbol for anything, apart from a symbol <laughs> that kind of person you really wouldn't want to trust as far as you could throw him. Um, but... <laughs> um, he would he's definitely the kind of person who um uh, needs to be talked about um because he did have these ideas um which very much tapped into and i'm sorry i'm totally going to go and make this serious um <laughs> tapped into uh, um a vein of government strategy um which was explicitly imperialist mm -hmm. um so in that sense he's very much a topical person to talk about um that is probably as far as i'm going to go with that um, <laughs> i don't touch the b word with no, the pole nowadays um so i'm gonna leave it there but um and then i'm gonna come and find you jimmy <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I want to uh, I want to thank the presenters for this insightful and interesting talks. I want to thank our uh, attendees who were spent in uh, last hour with us, and I want to remind them that uh, this symposium still continues. We'll take about a fifteen minute break, and we'll have a session number four entitled "The French Way of War," discussing the nature of the French and uh, especially Napoleonic uh, art of warfare. Goodbye and see you in a couple of minutes.